What a great chapter, and we probably, many of us, so familiar with this chapter from Soul Winning, and uh, we, we quote this a lot. Oftentimes, just taking a couple verses out of it and not really considering the whole chapter, which can be dangerous, but in this case, I don't think we're necessarily quoting it or using it incorrectly. But you see here, he's talking primarily about his burden for Israel at that time. That's who he's preaching to, a lot of these lost uh, Jews. And, you know, he kept saying that they, you know, they got a zeal for the Lord, but not according to knowledge. And he wanted to give them the true gospel, but they rejected it. You know how frustrated he gets as you follow the story around. He's like, fine, I'm going to the Gentiles then. Next thing you know, he's in the synagogue preaching to Jews. <laughs> and he's just like trying so hard to get them, to convince them because they had the scripture and he showed them, hey, this was Jesus. And, and uh, you know, so th what, what a great chapter. We use it as we're preaching the gospel. Uh, how many say almost every time they are able to present the whole gospel, they come to, to Romans 10 at some point? Yeah, so I mean, this is pretty, uh, pretty familiar, pretty common. Many memorized it. I asked Brother Justin, I figured he had the whole chapter memorized because I hear him quoting the first half of this a lot of times. And uh, would be a good one to memorize if you are trying to memorize certain chapters or whatever. But I want to talk tonight about, because usually if you said, well, where do you find the sinner's prayer in the Bible? Somebody, you know, saying a prayer to be saved. Oftentimes they'll take you to this, confess with the mouth, call upon the Lord, and they'll go to uh, Romans chapter 10. And I want to talk about that tonight, the sinner's prayer, the sinner's prayer. Now, we are a soul winning church, and so we, I believe, have it down. I think everybody in here knows how to give the gospel, at least the major, well, you know, vast majority know how to give the gospel. We understand what salvation is. We go out, we take it to the world on a regular basis, knocking on doors. So why do we need to hear about this? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, we do get new people from time to time, or maybe somebody tune into the live stream or whatever who doesn't really know how we do, why we do what we do, and how we present the gospel. Uh, and then, not only that, but sometimes after doing something over and over and over, we kind of lose sight of just the fundamentals. You know what I mean? Of uh, I was kind of thinking about this. Uh, I never was a good basketball player. I could just tell you that right now. But I did play basketball for a time, and I was going to try out for the basketball team. I was like, I need to learn a little bit more about basketball. And so I went to the, I think it was a library, and I found a VHS. I don't even think we had CDs back in those days. I'm aging myself. <laughs> and uh, we had a VHS, and I got something on Larry Bird. Anybody remember Larry Bird? I'm also dating myself. Larry Bird, I shouldn't say this, think of a bird, like he had a beak, he had a big old beak, and so uh, we always remember his name, and Larry Bird uh, taught this video, and you know what, there was nothing fancy about Larry Bird, back in the day, you put him up, he was on the uh, Celtics, wasn't it, and he, the, you always heard about him, and you heard about Jordan on the Bulls. And Jordan was fancy, did all the trick shots, three-pointers, dunks. Uh, I guess Larry Bird did a lot of three-pointers too. But, uh, but if you watch them play, you'd be like, hey, you know, there's no doubt about it. Uh, Michael Jordan was way better than Larry Bird. And all, everyone liked Michael, I mean, uh, Michael, jo uh, what did I say? Yeah, Michael Johnson. No, Michael, what's his name? Jordan, Jordan thank you. Michael Jordan. And uh, see, I don't have any kind of illustration, long nose or anything like that. How do you remember Jordan? <laughs> yeah, Jordan, Air Jordans, of course. All right, so uh, Michael Jordan uh, was fancy. You know, he did all the dunk contests and everything. That's what all the kids liked. But I remember watching this, vi this video, and it was saying, hey, it doesn't matter how fancy it looks. It doesn't matter, you know, all the, you know, fame and all that kind of stuff. If you're playing the game to score points, what matters is the fundamentals. And I think about that, you know, in a lot of areas in life, like if you get past all those trying to look fancy and doing this and learning new, new ways to do things and all that stuff, you can get distracted and sometimes forget. But Larry Bird, the reason he was so good is because he just stuck with the fundamentals and he had the basic shots and stuff down that nobody could defend. And he scored a lot of points and he gave, gave a lot of uh, assists. He couldn't make it look good like Michael Jordan did, but you know, at the end of the day, they both were at the top of their game and had a lot of points and a lot of assists and all that stuff. Not a huge basketball fan, as you might have already been able to tell, but I do know that much about it, and I did watch the Larry Bird uh, training video. <laughs> okay, I'm still not good at basketball, but <laughs> but it made a good illustration one day. Who who would have known? <laughs> so when we're preaching the gospel. 
we have to just remember the fundamentals. Really, it goes back to the fundamentals. And sometimes it's good if, if you've been soul winning for a long time and then you go with somebody who's just learning how to present the gospel and you watch them, you're just like, I don't know, there's like a purity there. And there's just like a, you know, wow, like we got to not get away from just the, the main thing, you know, which is presenting the gospel. And so it's good that we talk about this. And then here's another reason, because the reality is, and I'm tired of people saying door to door soul winning doesn't work. I hear that all the time. And it's been something that's been said a long time. And what they mean by door to door soul winning doesn't work is they mean it. That's not a fast way to build your church and get a lot of people in there. Okay. But that's not why we're going out and doing it. I believe door to door soul winning works. I believe a lot of people are getting saved. A lot of people are hearing the gospel, uh, whether or not they say a prayer or not. Okay. And I'm going to get into that in a minute, but um, the reality is that we know not everybody who says a prayer gets saved, and that's biblical. Okay, we understand Paul struggled with that. Said, "Hey, well, you told me you believe this. <laughs> you know, did you believe in vain?" And and there's different times where he throws a question kind of like that out. And if you've never done follow up to a, somebody after they after they get saved, you do a follow up visit. It is pretty common to go back and find out they weren't saved. You know the uh, biggest example that I remember that just broke my heart was when I went soul winning. Uh, I was in Bible college and uh, went soul winning. I don't remember the situation, but I remember I led this guy to the Lord and I was so excited. But I do remember he had been drinking. I just don't, I didn't know how much he had been drinking. But the next day, because he said, yeah, I'm going to go to church with you in the morning and everything. And so he, he got saved and he was excited. I went there to, to meet him and, to, and I talked to him about picking him up for church. And he's kind of like, I really don't remember talking to you. <laughs> so I went through again. Well, what do you think you have to do to get saved? And he's like, man, I don't even really believe that. I was like, yeah, but, but just yesterday I showed you the gospel and I showed you about this. And he's like, I'm sorry, man. I, he said, I had a whole lot to drink because there's no telling what I did. But he said the words, right? And I led him in a prayer. And so somebody said, well, wasn't he saved? I have a hard time believing he's saved when I go back and he's like, I don't believe that. I don't even know what you're talking about, right? So... But that doesn't make me, because, you know, I've told people this about the reality of follow-up soul winning. I mean, following up to soul winning and, uh, and, and, you know, finding out how many people didn't really get saved. And I remember telling somebody that, and they said, well, I hope you don't tell your people that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Why would I like, hide it? Oh, yeah, all those people got saved. Oh, yeah, they all got saved. No, I want everybody to know that this is the reality of it. And we need to know that, hey, sometimes people, they, for whatever reason, they need to not only hear the gospel preached, but you need to go back and water it or at least pray that to God that he'll send somebody else to water it or something because not everybody just holds on to that, although we'd like to believe that. I remember uh, one, uh, this black fellow, we knocked on his door and I began, uh, th this was early when we started the follow-up uh, process that we have now. And Valerie and I went and knocked on his door and he came out. And uh, we started going, uh, uh, he said, oh, yeah, I remember those guys came to my door and, and all that. And we started going through some things and I, and come to find out he believed in workspace, I mean, hardcore workspace salvation. I was like, well, you know, when the guy came to your door, didn't he say this and that? Because I'm familiar with the guys that knocked on his door and I know what they teach. He said, oh, yeah, they said that. And I said, well, didn't you pray and, and, and ask God? And he said, yeah, he said, I was just trying to be nice because I didn't want them to be offended and all that stuff. It broke my heart, too, because I'm like, I don't, you know, at least you told me the truth, <laughs> you know. And he said, oh, yeah, I don't really believe that. I just I just went through the motions. But listen to me, don't get discouraged by that because that's just the reality of it. But you're doing what you are supposed to do going out there and preaching the gospel. Now, I'm going to get to the end of this, why we put the numbers on the board and why we count salvations and people that called on the name of the Lord uh, and said a prayer or whatever, why we count those and, and, and the reasons for it, I think it's good. I think we should do it. But I don't want anybody to be discouraged. But at the same time, I want you to know that it doesn't matter how big that number is, right? We don't. If we do get to the point where we're going out there just to get lots of numbers and to say, hey, look how many souls we won and not really concerned about whether or not they got it, they understood it, well, then, yeah, we are doing something wrong at that point. And so we don't want to, uh, to do that. I'm okay with uh, the fact that not everybody gets saved, uh, but I do like to make sure, first and foremost, that the people believe. And, 
and I'll probably get to this in a minute, but quite honestly, and I'm not telling anybody to do anything differently. Don't, don't take this as a, you know, as me telling you to do something differently than you're doing right now. But if you've been soul winning with me, you may have realized that I'm not as fast to lead somebody in a prayer as a lot of people are. And it's okay if you, if you are, but I'm just not. I'm more concerned that they understand it because my thinking is, you know what, if they understand it and they believe it and I walk away, you know, at least they understand it. You know what I mean? And, 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 but at the same time, if I know that they understand it, obviously I'm going to lead them in a prayer and I'll explain, I'll explain why here at the, that's the point of the message. Okay. But you may have noticed, man, he just doesn't seem like he's getting a lot of people saved or he's not. Look, I hope I'm getting a lot more people saved than I write on the board. <laughs> right? But sometimes I'm not so quick to lead somebody in prayer because I don't think that they got it yet. And let me say, let me, let me preface by saying, this is not what, this is not the reason why. Some people are like, oh, I don't ever lead them in prayer because I don't want to give them a false hope. That's not why I don't lead them in prayer. <laughs> because the way I look at that is when you knocked on the door and they were lost and then you leave and they said a prayer, but they're still lost. How could you give them a false hope? They already had a false hope. They thought they were going to heaven before you showed them the gospel, right? Oh yeah, I'm pretty good. I, I do good works. That was the false hope that they had. Now you preached it. If they said, had a hard time interpreting what you preached and they didn't follow that, they don't have any more, any, any more of a false hope than they had before. So that's a ridiculous argument whenever people say that, okay? That's not why. It's just, you know, I, I, hopefully the message will, uh, will help you understand kind of my thinking on this. But it's not to, uh, to minimize leading somebody in a prayer. So that's the point that I want to make. But, but the sinner's prayer is a... Uh, a phrase, this word that uh, a phrase that is used. I don't even necessarily like that phrase. Okay, uh, uh, let, first of all, before I go there, let's go look at our text. Okay, so Romans chapter ten. What is salvation? Well, here we go. Romans chapter ten. I want you to see this. What he's stressing here, verse two. Remember, he's talking about Israel. He says, "For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge." The emphasis is on the knowledge, what they know, what they understand, what they believe in their heart, okay? They're, they're off on that. They have a zeal for the Lord. They are all about the works. They're all about following the law, but they don't have the knowledge, okay? Look at verse, uh, uh, let me see here, verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God. You see, they're ignorant of God's righteousness, you know, they're, they're ignorant of the fact that they are, are so unrighteous no matter how hard they try to do the works, but they're righteous only if they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, this is, this is the gospel, but I'm just saying that here he's saying that they are ignorant. Okay, so if you're ignorant, that means you don't know something. You don't understand something. Verse, uh, let me see, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. All right. The believing, we know that. I mean, you go through the book of John and I think it's something like a hundred times we see that salvation is believing in Jesus Christ. There's, you really can't read John and come up with any other conclusion unless you say, well, John was, he was leaving something out <laughs> because John is very, very clear. And John is like written like a gospel track. I mean, it's like, you know, these things, right? I unto you, right? He's basically telling you why he's writing the book. And over and over, he's showing even Jesus' words saying, believe, believe, believe. And this is salvation. It has to do with, with uh, changing what you believe, what you think and believe about something. Okay, so this is uh, very clear all throughout the Bible. But even in this chapter here, we see, how about verse 8? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. So he's talking about the heart. He's talking about faith. I want you to understand that is, a, that is the main focus here in this chapter. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart. Verse uh, 10 and 11, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Okay, so obviously we see these verses in here, this mentioning the mouth, mentioning calling on the Lord, mentioning confessing, but the emphasis is on belief, is on, on knowing, 
Okay, not being ignorant. And, uh, and if you could confess something with the mouth, but if you don't believe it, it doesn't really mean anything. You can say the words and say you're saved. A lot of false prophets say they're saved. I, I don't know how many times I've heard a preacher and said, that guy just said, I've heard Ray Comfort, a, a certain clip that sounded like he gave the gospel and he's saved. But then you watch him present the gospel to somebody else and you're like, whoa, you just butchered that. <laughs> and so, you know, not everybody who just professes with their mouth to believe a certain thing really believes it. That's the problem. We don't, that's what makes it hard to know if somebody really gets saved or not. Okay, so uh, let me see here. Verse, did we already do 11? Okay, verse 11. But what uh, for, the script, uh, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him, shall not be ashamed. Okay. And it goes on here. So, but what we want to talk about is the sinner's prayer. Well, then if it's just about believing, why do you lead him in a prayer? You know, why are these verses in here about confessing and calling on the Lord? <clears throat> well, let me give you a couple more thoughts before I give you the main points of the sermon. A couple more thoughts about the sinner's prayer. Okay. So some people would say, I'm going to give you a bunch of different ideas that are out there, okay? Different people's views on what is called the sinner's prayer. You know, you can look up on Wikipedia, and there's a spot for the sinner's prayer. And it'll tell you all these different examples. I read through several examples uh, yesterday, or yesterday, and talking about, like, uh, basically it's like what you would see on a gospel track at the very end. Like, this is the prayer to, to pray or whatever. Some of them were really, really good. And I was like, hey, who are these people? I don't know, but they, they were good. And some of them were totally like a, a lordship salvation. But when you talk about the sinner's prayer, most people understand what you're talking about. In fact, a couple of you guys may have met Ben in Iola. Ben lived in a group home, had some mental issues, and it was hard to... I was super patient with him. I tried to... to invest a lot of time and effort with him. Uh, I felt like he had gotten saved and I baptized him. Not a hundred percent sure, but that's another story. Okay. So, uh, so Ben, when he first started coming to church, he was just, he would start crying. He was real emotional because his mental condition and, uh, and he was crying and he was like, he didn't want to go to hell. And, and he's, and I kept trying to explain to him the gospel. And he's like, just show me the sinner's prayer. Just tell me the sin. What is the sinner's prayer? What do I need to pray? Well, I knew about Ben that he had been going for years to a Catholic church. Okay. So he was confused between what they were saying and what we were saying. And when he goes to the Catholic church, they had all these prayers that he's supposed to pray. And I remember he first started coming to church and he had some, uh, uh, he had rosary beads. And I was like, Ben, I started preaching against the rosary beads. And I was like, don't bring those to church. Those don't mean anything. They don't do anything for you. And he was like, oh, but I learned all these prayers and they just give me comfort. And I'm like, well, you know, you need to get your comfort from the Word of God and from the Lord and not in these prayer beads, okay? And so he was, uh, he was memorizing prayers and hoping that memorizing those prayers were going to do something for his soul. And he prayed to Mary and all that kind of stuff. And so I was trying to show him that, hey, I know what you mean by sinner's prayer, but basically what I was telling him is there is no sinner's prayer. He said, yes, yes, I read this, track, this, this uh, gospel track, and in the back of it it said, the sinner's prayer. And I want to know what to pray. So he went over to where our tracks are, and he started looking through them. And I was like, Ben, Ben, yeah, there are some, there's a verse, there's a part at the end of those tracks that tells you what you can pray. I said, but there is no sinner's prayer. There's nothing in the Bible that says, say this prayer, and you'll be saved. And he, he just couldn't get it. And I don't know if it was a mental condition or the false teaching that he had heard or whatever, but he could not get that. So finally, uh, one day he's in my office and I'm going through that. He seemed to be understanding uh, the gospel and I explained it all to him. And I got down to the end and I said, well, do you believe that? And he said, yeah. And I'm like, so if you, you know, if you called on the Lord, do you think that he would save you? And he said, yeah. And at that point, I'm still not sure in my head what to do with him. I don't, I don't want to lead him in a prayer or make him think that there's this magical prayer that he prayed. And all of a sudden, he bowed his head and he just started praying on his own. Now, how many of you have ever had that happen? You know, or somebody does that. It's pretty interesting whenever they do. I'm going to tell you, not, not everybody does that. Okay, Some people are very timid. There are some people that will never pray uh, out loud. And, uh, and, and so I'm going to get to that part in a minute. But he just kind of started praying, and he actually prayed the right thing, okay? Because sometimes uh, I've done that in my life, and I've, and I've said, hey, so you think yeah, if you called on the Lord to save you, he'd save you? And, I, and they'd say, yeah, yeah, I do. And i say, okay, well, why don't you pray? Why don't you just, it's just, you know, something like this. Tell the Lord, and then I would say something, and then I'd say, okay, you pray. And they say, 
God, uh, I'm praying that you bless my dad. He's real sick right now. And if you would just heal him and, and all this. And I'm thinking, that's not what you're supposed to be praying. <laughs> Thank you for the food that you give us and the night and all this. And I'm like, no, you're supposed to be praying for your salvation, right? The thing was, they didn't know what to pray. All they know how to pray for is their food and for their family because <laughs> that's all they've ever prayed for in their life. And so when you ask them to pray, they're like, I don't really know how to pray. How many times have you said, well, I don't know how to pray? And you're like, well, that's okay. I'll lead you in a prayer. Some people have a hard time, a, a big problem with that. They don't want you to do that, okay? So some people will say it's Catholic. I would, uh, yeah, it's a Catholic type thing. You memorize this prayer and you say it. That's the kind of the thinking that I had with Ben, for instance. I could see where somebody could get confused thinking there's this magical prayer that will save him. <clears throat> and at the same time, I tell people that when I was, when I got saved as a kid, I said a prayer and I, and I've told people this and I was trusting in that prayer to get me to heaven. They said, oh, you're trusting in a prayer. Then you're not even saved. You're supposed to be trusting in the Lord. I'm trusting that the Lord heard that prayer and then he answered it. Okay. But I was trusting in that prayer. I, I don't know. I just said a prayer cause I was asked to, I was asked to say a prayer and, and, uh, and I was trusting in that. But some people would say that, Hey, that's, there's nothing in the Bible. Show me chapter and verse where there's a repeat after me prayer, you know, or there's even a prayer that's like pray, you know, asking for salvation. Really, it's it's hard to to pinpoint certain verses uh, like that tell you what to say. And so, uh, and so, some people have a big problem with that. Some people say that if you pray for your salvation, that would be a work. Have you ever heard anyone say that? If you're if you're if it's the prayer that saves you, then that's a work. And I would say that that could be true if somebody thinks, well, I know I'm saved because I said. A prayer. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I suppose somebody could be confused on that, uh, but that's just something that you hear from time to time. Some people would say uh, that it is or at least leads to easy believism. Okay. Now, some of you guys, I've told you this before, some of you kind of freak out because you're thinking, whoa, uh, is he Lordship Salvation or something? No, you guys know me better than that. <laughs> but, uh, but I've said this before, I don't claim easy believism. I, don't, I understand the people that do, and I don't have a problem with that because, yes, Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is quite simple, all right? Uh, what Jesus did for us was all the work. Our work is, I mean, how much simpler can you get than just free, <laughs> right? The gift of God, that's pretty simple, okay? Here's why I don't embrace that terminology personally. Because I was raised uh, in such a way that the word easy believism meant somebody was going around knocking on doors saying, hey, say this prayer, and then they would say, yeah, you're saved. And they would go, hey, say this prayer and you're saved. I've seen it. I remember this uh, soul winning presentation I saw online where these, this group, I don't know what church they went to or what, but they're going through the mall. And they say, hey, you know for sure you're going to heaven? No, no, I don't know for sure if I'm going to heaven. Well, do you want to go to heaven? Yeah. Well, then let's say this prayer. And they would just lead them in a prayer and they say, hey, now you're saved. I'm like, whoa, they didn't even teach him the gospel or Jesus, who Jesus Christ is <laughs> or anything. They just made him say this prayer. Now, that is what I was taught is easy believism. Okay, and so this is why I'm hesitant to, to embrace that term because usually when people say, you're easy believism, well, it's the same reason I would never embrace the word lordship salvation, even though he is the Lord and Savior. <laughs> and and, uh, and when, he, when I get saved, he's the Lord of my life and, and all that. But I don't embrace it because I understand the people that are out there teaching that and doing that and what they mean by that. And so I'm hesitant. I'll tell you the, the truth. I hate labels. I really do. I wish we could go through our Christian life without label. He's Calvinist and he's this and he's that. Because I think that that really muddies stuff up to some degree. But then in another degree, I'm like, hey, well, you don't, people don't know what you believe unless you can line up with a certain, you know, well, I'm not that. And if you're like, I'm not that and I'm not that and people don't know what you are. So you kind of end up just lining up with somebody. And that's, you know, that's why in some circles I'd be like, well, yes. I'm easy believism. Yes, I'm post-trib. Some people, oh, post-trib. Okay, well, let me explain to you what that means. They won't listen to that part. They're just like, hey, title, I know what you believe. No, you probably don't. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, so I hate titles, but they're, an, uh, they're a necessary evil. Then there's a hybrid of the sinner's prayer. And this is something that I grew up with this. And it was like this. They have to say a prayer or else they're not saved. But you can't do a repeat after me prayer, <laughs> okay? And the thinking was, if it's a repeat after me prayer, then they didn't really believe it. They're just repeating after you, and, uh, and so they didn't really get saved. It has to be from the heart, okay? 
Now, I grew up with that thinking, which led to, okay, why don't you pray? God, thank you for my mom and my dad and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not the prayer, right? So then I was torn growing up thinking, well, how, what do I do? Like, what is the prayer that, I, that they have to pray? So then you're like leading them. You're like, okay, I'm going to let you say a prayer and say this, say something like that. And you're basically leading them, telling them what to pray. And then you say, okay, now you do it. You're like, what was it again? No, 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 I'm not going to lead you. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? They kind of like us this, this little trap. But I was taught this kind of hybrid of, of uh, hey, you have to say the prayer in order to get saved, but they have to say it. And, and, and if you hear it, you know, then, then you'll know whether they're saved or not. So their thing would be, hey, if someone started praying and they said, you know, bless my dad or my mom, then the reason they're not saved is because they didn't, they didn't understand it, which could be true, right? In the few situations I've ever had where somebody just started praying on their own and one by step by step in their prayer, they were saying everything right. It was just like, this person definitely got it, right? But there are other times where it's not quite so easy. So we do lead people in the sinner's prayer. So the question is, why? Okay, so my first point is this. What is calling on the Lord? What is calling on the Lord? Now, if you just look up in the Bible, the places where there's, such thing as calling on the Lord, you see that calling on the Lord could be, Lord, help, right? That's calling on the Lord. Help me, I'm dying. And so you're calling on the Lord to help you. And by the way, all these definitions would be in our, our English dictionary today, these different uses of the word calling, okay? Calling could be visiting somebody. I'm going to make a call. I'm going to make a house call. You ever heard that? I mean, we don't really use that terminology very much. But what it means is you're going to visit somebody. It doesn't mean you're calling them on the phone or something like that. You're going to go call upon that person. It means you're going to go to their house and you're going to visit them, all right? Calling can be simply to invoke somebody, usually a God or a spiritual being, you know, and you're evoking them. You're, you're, uh, uh, you're, uh, you're calling. I'm going to look at 1 Kings as, a, as an example. 1 Kings 17. First Kings 17 and verse 18. And this is the great challenge where Elijah challenges all the prophets to a contest, basically. Uh, is it who's the who's the true God? You call on yours, and I'll call on mine. And here's what he says, and he and uh and she's uh let me see here. Uh oh. What did I do here? Where is that uh, passage I was just talking about? Obviously, I got it wrong. Is it 2 Kings? 2 Kings 17. Oh, good grief. What did I do? All right. Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Anybody know off the top of your head where that is? See, this was something I wrote by hand in the car. That's always dangerous. First, okay. So I must have got my 17 and my 18 mixed up. First Kings 18. Okay. So let's just start with, uh, oh man, I don't want to read the, the whole thing. Let me see here. Okay, how about verse 21? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll read the story, starting in verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose uh, one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under and call ye on the name of your gods. And I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire. 
let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And then they went on to do this. And of course, you've got uh, the prophets of Baal calling on their God. Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. And they're cutting themselves and they're, and they're doing all this oh, crazy stuff. And Elijah's sitting back mocking them, right? But then whenever he calls on the Lord, of course, the fire comes down. And so sometimes this calling isn't necessarily like a formal prayer, but it could be a prayer. And it's just calling on him and it's, and it's professing him. And it's saying, uh, it's showing that he is your God. Look at Genesis 4. Genesis 4, verse 26. This is very early on in history. This is only uh, the second generation, right? Adam and Eve, after Cain killed Abel, they have another son, Seth. Verse 26, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse 8. This is obviously the chapter about Abraham leaving his country and his father. And verse 8 says, And he removed from this unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. Now turn to Acts chapter 2. Now, Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost, and we're all familiar with that story and the, the, all the different tribes coming and then the disciples of Christ speak in tongues, all right? They speak of tongues of all these different tribes and everyone is understanding them in their own language. And some of the people are like, wow, these guys must be drunk with new wine or something. And, uh, and they says, no, 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 we're, you know, the, these guys aren't drunk. He said, this is uh, the prophecy that Joel prophesied. And so then he kind of quotes to them Joel chapter two. It's pretty close. I'm just we're not we won't look at Joel, but uh, it's pretty pretty close word word for word. A little bit out of order, uh, different order than Joel. But look at chapter two, verse fourteen of Acts. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto him, Ye men of Ju Judea, and all ye uh, that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but, a, but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I shall show wonder, uh, wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath and blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. So stop right there before I read the next verse. So what he's saying in reference to Joel, Joel's prophecy was that the that great and terrible day of the Lord is coming. Now we read in the book of Revelations, we know what day that's talking about. That's the day that God uh, begins to pour out his wrath on uh, the earth, okay? And uh, quite honestly, this is right. God's people are taken up to heaven in the rapture, and then God pours his wrath out on the earth. And he's saying, hey, that day's going to come. Because remember, the prophets were all prophesying, hey, you guys are going to go into captivity and all this. And there was a uh, an immediate fulfillment of that prophecy, but there was also a, a, a future prophecy being made that we don't understand until we get to the book of Revelation. Well, I mean, we can now looking back, we can compare Jesus's words and Thessalonians and, and all, and we can see this uh, put together. But what he's saying is that, you know, after uh, God's going to save his people, right, from the wrath to come, and then the great day of the Lord's coming and the wrath's poured out, and we understand that's the end, okay? That's the end for God's mercy on certain people, and then the great judgment in the end, the day of God's, uh, I mean, the, the, the future wrath in hell for all eternity. And so when he's talking about people being saved from that, he's talking, you know, he's, you have to kind of put this all together, and he's talking about those people who call upon the name of the Lord. Look at verse 20. 
or 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from God's wrath, which ultimately will include wrath in the lake of fire. Okay, and so we want to be saved from that. And so we have to call upon the name of the Lord. But what he's talking about is basically just his people, right? His people, those who profess him and those who he professes are those who call upon the name of the Lord. Now, that could take place in different ways, but the fact is, hey, th he's their God and they're his people because they are believers. Okay, and this is what we're going to see. Notice uh, Acts chapter 9. And we're going to go back and forth between Acts chapter 9, which is the conversion of Saul, the apostle Paul, and then 20, chapter 22, where he goes back and and it gives his testimony to the people there. And he gives us testimony about what happened in Acts chapter 9. So we see it from the narrator's point of view, which is kind of like Ananias's point of view is what we'll see. And then later on, we're gonna, he's going to give it from his point, Paul's point of view. All right, let's look at Acts 9 verse 16. For, uh, let's back up. Let me see here. Verse 15, this is God's, uh, let's see, verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done uh, to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings and, uh, and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, uh, ha hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Okay. Now, before I read chapter 22, I want you to notice the order there. Okay. He comes to Ananias and Ananias says, Brother Saul, right? God told me, and then he, you know, he, he prays for him, lays his hands on him. He gets to, receives a, the Holy Ghost, and then he's baptized, okay? I believe he's saved long before he's baptized. The point I want to make, because look at chapter 22. People get confused on this. Chapter 22. Look at, uh, let's read his whole testimony, starting with verse 1. Men and brother and fathers, uh, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the, uh, the more silence and said, uh, and he said, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to, uh, to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. See, he's, he's, he's giving his credentials. He's speaking to them in such a way that they're going to listen to him and they're going to understand the authority that he has to say all this. And I persecuted this way, un, talking about the way of Christianity, this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders from whom I also I received letters unto, uh, unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them uh, which uh, were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me, and I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art, who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom thou persecuteth. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake unto me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there, uh, in, there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed unto thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of the light being led 
by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus, and one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked upon, uh, up upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see the just one, and uh, shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now someone to read that just that verse and say, there you go, man. Baptism washes away your sins. And, and when you're baptized, you're calling on the name of the Lord. But wait a minute, we go back to chapter 9. We see that that's not what happened. He was already saved. He had already called on the Lord. His sins had already been washed away. And then he went and he was baptized, okay? And so this is a similar passage to like uh, Mark 16, 16, where, well, let's just turn there. Mark 16, 16. This confuses people because it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Oh man, if you didn't get baptized, then you're not saved. Well, that, no, because it keeps on saying, going. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Okay, so it's the believing that has to do with whether or not somebody's saved. But if they believe, guess what they're going to do? They're going to follow the Lord in baptism. Now, that doesn't mean if you don't get baptized, you're not saved. But it's saying, hey, this is a way that they profess the name of the Lord. And they said, hey, well, let's make this public, right? And, and, and they would be baptized. Uh, not everywhere in the book of Acts, when somebody gets saved, do you see them getting baptized right after. So that doesn't mean, that doesn't have anything to do with, well, if you didn't get baptized, then you didn't get saved. That's just the way that they profess that, hey, we're saved. And so that was often those two were linked together. There was salvation, and then there was a public profession of their salvation. You know what they were doing? They were calling on the Lord. They were confessing the Lord. They were confessing with their mouth that He was their Lord and that they believed uh, properly. Okay, now I want you to notice, uh, I missed this. Go back to chapter 9. we got to see this is an important part of the message. Acts chapter 9. So let's look at this again. Look at verse 11. So this is God talking to Ananias here. And he says, And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. What does that mean? And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. You remember when he's struck him with blindness... Right? He's like, Lord, what do you want me to do? <laughs> he's, he's like, okay, I, I get the picture because Jesus himself is saying, hey, why kickest thou against the pricks? Okay, What does that mean? What, what, how is he kicking against the pricks? Well, I believe at least one time, probably a lot more times than this, dealing with Christians and, and, and persecuting them and taking it. You ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs or something like that where it talks about people that you know, died at the stake or whatever, and they profess their uh, their faith. And sometimes the people that were putting them to death because of their strong faith ended up getting saved because they saw their testimony and they saw that, and it was very powerful. I believe it's quite possible Paul, in persecuting these Christians, saw a lot of great testimonies, okay? But one thing we know for sure is that he saw Stephen because Stephen was being per persecuted and, and, and stoned right before his feet. Right? Or he's holding all the, the coats and all that kind of stuff, and he's watching Stephen be stoned. Stephen preached the entire gospel right there in, what is it, chapter 7 or chapter 8, chapter 7. And he's preached the entire gospel, 7 and 8. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and here, is, here is the Apostle Paul hearing that gospel being preached, watching this man be stoned to death. And now here he is sometime later walking on the road to Damascus, and he's hit with his light, and Jesus says, Why, Why kickest thou against the pricks? The Holy Spirit had had gone into the Apostle Paul through the preaching of the Word, and he had to make a decision whether he was going to believe that or he was not going to believe that. 
Well, guaranteed, if you happen to, and I'm not saying this is going to happen to you, okay? Don't be, start making YouTube videos saying you have to see this bright light or else you didn't get saved, right? But <laughs> I believe if you saw a bright light and you heard Jesus say, hey, why, per, why kickest thou against the pricks? You'd probably be like, all right, Lord, I get it. <laughs> what do you want me to do? I trust you. I believe you. I, you know what I mean? I believe all the stuff that that man preached about the gospel. I believe it, all right? Uh, you know, whatever the case, we don't have all the details, but here's what we know. Paul had a spirit that said, I want to know at this point, I'm praying, Lord, what will you have me to do? I'm going to seek the man that you want to give me more. And in his heart, he received that word that was preached and he called on the name of the Lord. Right? I don't see anywhere where he said a particular prayer. He did say, Lord, what will you have me to do? Uh, but, I, but the fact is he began calling upon the name of the Lord. Calling upon the name of the Lord is the same as confessing with the mouth the Lord Jesus. Let's go back to Romans chapter 10. You ever notice how both of those are used in this passage? Start. Is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Right? Verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is all running together because he's saying, confessing with your mouth is calling upon the Lord. Now how do I confess with the mouth? I've seen it different in different people. <laughs> okay? All I know is at the end of the day, they believe the gospel and they're professing with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed in the gospel and they called on the Lord. For some, that was, Lord, please save me. I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> you know, I trust in you. I, I. For some, it was just a quick little prayer saying, yeah, I believe that. And from that day forward, they said, hey, I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven if I die because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And they professed the Lord. To some, you know, they went and they started telling people, that's professing. <laughs> hey, you want to know uh, uh, how you can be saved, how you can know for sure you're going to heaven? And they began to preach the gospel. They're conf certainly confessing with their mouth. They're certainly calling upon the name of the Lord. There's no bones about it. They have put their faith in Jesus Christ. So why then do we promote leading somebody in prayer? Because I do promote that. That's part of our, as we take somebody through a soul winning presentation, I'm going to say, hey, at the end of this presentation, here is what we do. We lead them in prayer, if we can. Like I said, I'm not as quick to do that as some others are. But why do we do that? I'll tell you. Number one, this brings closure to the deal. Okay, what do you mean by that? Well, real simple. I mentioned Ray Comfort earlier. I like to pick on him. <laughs> Have you ever seen a Ray Comfort presentation? He says, hey, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Maybe he doesn't say that. I don't remember how he, how, how he starts it off. And when they start thinking that they're going to heaven, he says, well, have you ever? And he starts going through the commandments. Have you ever done this? Have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever done this? And then uh, and, and he begins to tell them, hey, by your own admission, you are a lying, stealing, thieving, adulterous, blah, 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 blah. And he gets the video and the photographer, you know, has got the or a filmographer or whatever, has got that look on the person's face. Maybe they're starting to cry a little bit. And he says, uh, and he says, so what are you going to do? And they're like, well, I guess I'll stop sinning. He said, yeah, you need to believe in Jesus Christ and you need to stop sinning. <laughs> and I mean, he like leaves, you know, or he just leaves them. All right, well, you need to go home and you need to think about that. Or he leaves them with something and it's like, well, so did the person get saved or did they not get saved? They certainly didn't get saved if they think, hey, well, I got to just start doing right and, and living clean and then I'll be saved. That's a works-based salvation. Now, he'll say, I don't teach a works-based salvation. But based on that presentation, if somebody leaves and they think, well, I got to quit sinning or else I'm not saved, he taught a works-based salvation, okay? There's no closure. There's no closure. How do, you, how do you close? Well, here would be one way to close the deal. Hey, you want to get baptized? Yeah. <laughs> hey, do you, do you admit that you just call, I mean, that you just uh, uh, profess Christ and you uh, are, are, are saved, you put your faith in Jesus Christ? That would be a public profession. That would close the deal. 
But guess what? Unless I take Brother uh, uh, David's advice and we get a little trailer with the baptismal and we drive around the neighborhoods knocking on doors, <laughs> unless we do that, we don't have water nearby at everybody. I guess after someone gets saved, we say, hey, you got a bathtub upstairs? Hey, we can go fill that up real quick and, uh, and baptize you. But baptism accomplishes the same thing that leading in a prayer does. And I'm not, I mean, they, they still should get baptized after they get saved, okay? Uh, but I'm saying that here is why we do it. Yeah, well, show me chapter and verse. Well, there's no chapter and verse, but guess what? If they were saved before you led them in a prayer, they're saved after you lead them in a prayer too, okay? Here's why we say the prayer. It, it's closure. It closes the deal. Okay, so you believe that? Now, I don't know your heart. But I can hear you, your mouth, and I can know if you're calling on the Lord. I can hear, hear if you're uh, professing the Lord. And so we will provide some kind of closure by saying, okay, well, let's tell the Lord that that's what you believe. That's often the way we say it. You know, sometimes we'll say pray and ask for salvation. I think probably it's better. Uh, I mean, it's okay to say that. I mean, I got, there's nothing wrong with that. You're, they're, they're certainly realizing that the only way they can receive salvation is through Jesus Christ. And so they're asking for that salvation. That's, that's fine. That's, that's right. Okay. Or say, Hey, let's tell the Lord. I believe that. Hey, thank you, Lord, for saving me and all that. I'll get to what the prayer is here in a minute. Number two, this is confirmation. Okay. Because if we go knock on a whole bunch of doors and come back and say, well, you know what? I gave the gospel 20 times and they all said they believed it. And so therefore, Let's write 20. We're not going to do that, right? So how do we know who we record as a salvation? Well, those who prayed. Does that mean if they didn't pray, they didn't get saved? I don't know. They might have went inside and prayed. <laughs> they might have believed that. And maybe it's going to take a little time for them to say, hey, that's really what I believe. How many people in here got saved listening to a gospel presentation online? I know a lot of testimonies. You listen to a documentary or something. At the end of that, there was a gospel presentation. And he said, hey, if you believe that, uh, well, let me lead you in a prayer right now. And you said that and you got saved. Okay. How do you track a salvation? You know, well, if I'm at the door, I want to make sure that that person not only said, I believe that, but took it a step farther and said, I'm willing to tell the Lord that's what I believe. Or I'm willing to say a prayer and ask him to save me, right? To kind of seal the deal. Uh, that, that brings closure, brings confirmation. Another thing it does is, is it brings encouragement. Because if we can write down and say, hey, this is how many people profess that they made a, uh, they made a, uh, that they confessed Christ, you know, and called on the Lord, then we have a number that we can say, praise the Lord. Let's keep up the good work. Let's get more people saved. Now, look, some people hate that. Some people hate that. It's the same crowd that says, no, you can't lead people in a prayer. No, you can't say, you know, some people don't like that. But the fact of the matter is, if we know that we're doing the work and we know that people are, are believing the gospel that we preach to them and, they're, and, they're, and we're able to lead them in a prayer or able to hear with their mouth the confession, uh, the profession, then that encourages us. That's very encouraging, right? Is that the only way somebody gets saved? If I don't lead them in a prayer, then they didn't get saved. Now, I, I can't see the person's heart. I don't know if they believe and they put their faith in Jesus Christ or not. All I can do is hear their mouth, okay? So how, do we, how did they know 3,000 got saved in, the, in Acts 3, right after the day of Pentecost? How do we know 3,000 got saved? Well, it does say that they were, after they were, believed their, his word, that they were baptized. So there was some kind of a public profession there, I guess. But there are other cases in the Bible. How about the 5,000? There's no baptism there. I don't believe they could have been baptized if you read the context there. There's lots of times they're out preaching, Samaria, whatever, and there's not necessarily a body of water around. How do they know that they got saved? Well, I suppose they said, hey, well, do you believe that? Yeah, I believe that, you know. Now, Philip uh, preached to the Ethiopian eunuch. He did end up getting baptized, but before that he said, if you'll believe us with all thy heart, thou mayest be saved. And he said, I believe. <laughs> Right? He professed, he confessed with his mouth, the Lord Jesus, and he called on the Lord to save him. I don't know if he led him in a prayer. I don't know if he cried out to the Lord or what he did, but I know this. He called on the name of the Lord, and the Lord was his Savior after that. So the final point that I want to make is this. What, and it's real simple. What sinner's prayer should we use? You know, should we type up Wikipedia and see the, all the examples and find just that right one? On the track, uh, you know, that we uh, the gospel uh, uh, invite that we, that's got the gospel message on the back, uh, it, you know, gives uh, some kind of prayer at the end. I, believe, I can't even remember what it says right now. 
how do we know which one to use? Well, I'm going to tell you what three three things real quick, okay? That that you want to include. This is what I, I what I would su suggest, okay? Number one, I want I would want everybody to stress very clearly whether or not they're going to understand that. And the next day, somebody goes or the next week, somebody goes and knocks on their door. Maybe they'll give them the wrong answer. I don't know. But before you have them pray a prayer, I would stress. Now, there's no magical prayer. What you're saying, you're not getting saved because of some prayer. You know what I mean? All you're doing is saying, Lord, I believe that. And you're going to confess that with your mouth. And then you can lead them in the prayer. Now, what uh, should the uh, should the prayer say? Now, the Bible says this too. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Right? So what... What's in their heart, <laughs> you know I mean, you, you, want, you want it to come out of their mouth as well. <sighs> Number two, go through the points that you just made when you gave them the gospel. All right. If you, if you, preach, if you preach a certain gospel presentation and then the prayer that they pray has nothing to do with the gospel presentation, then the prayer is not really making a lot of sense. Okay. So the prayer that you would lead them in would basically go through the points that you just presented to them. And to me, this is this makes so much sense. When I finally got this, this is why I finally let go of, oh no, you can't let them repeat a prayer after you or else they didn't really mean it, okay? Well, here's why I let go of that because I don't know if they believe it or don't believe it no matter what they say or do, okay? But here's what I do know. I am reiterating what I just preached to them through the prayer that they're saying in the prayer, this is what I believe, okay? So if my prayer said, I mean, if my presentation said, first point, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In my prayer, I'm going to say, God, I know I'm a sinner, right? If I took them to Romans 6, 23 and said, the wages of sin is death. Now, according to the Bible, that death ends up in the eternal, you know, torment in hell. You know, death and hell were cast to the lake of fire. This is the second death. You know, because of your sins, you deserve to die, die and go to hell then a point of that prayer is going to be, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. And that's where you lose some people if they weren't paying attention <laughs> and they were deceiving you up to this point. They're like, whoa, 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 I deserve to go to hell. Yeah, you deserve to go to hell. Let me show you that verse again. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when they're praying that, they're saying, wow, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. You know, so what's the hope? You preach to them the gospel. So in your prayer, say, but I believe that Jesus Christ came. He's the son of God. He paid the price uh, for me. Uh, he died for my sins. He rose again from the dead. I believe that. That's the gospel that you preach to them, right? And so then you say, now I'm just uh, 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 calling on you to save me. Or sometimes I've just let them right into, thank you, Lord, for saving me. If you're praying the prayer, you're saying that this is what I believe in my heart. That means you're saved. And so you're saying, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Now they know, and maybe even add to that, and that I never have to pay for my sins in hell because Jesus already paid the price, okay? So you've taught them now, they know they're sinners. They know that they deserve to go to hell. They know their only hope of salvation was through Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ did. And they're accepting that and they're putting their faith in that. And now they're saved for all eternity. You just reiterated that this is what you told them. This is what they said they believed. And then they're saying that they believe it. Now, if you walk away from there and they're not saved, it's not your fault. <laughs> you did your job. You preached the gospel. You even gave them an opportunity to repeat that back and say, that's what I believe. If you walk away and they didn't believe that, that's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. But I always add, thank you for saving me, you know, because I, I think that that kind of helps them know in their mind, wow, I'm saved now, you know. And uh, <clears throat> hope that makes sense. Hope that didn't create any more, any new questions that you <laughs> didn't have before. But I hope that makes sense and, uh, and, and clarifies why we lead people in a sinner's prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our salvation not because of anything we did, not because of magical prayer that we prayed, not because of, uh, of re repenting and turning away from our sins, but our belief in what you provided as our salvation through Jesus Christ and the, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection. And Lord, we, uh, we put our trust in that. I believe everybody in here did. And, and I pray that you help us not to complicate that when we preach the gospel to other people, but to simplify it as much as we can that they might understand uh, uh, 
what salvation is. Help us boldly preach the gospel and to make it very, very clear uh, that people would hear that, they would know it, they would understand it, they'd no longer be ignorant, and then they would have an opportunity to confess with their mouth that they believe that and that they received you as their Savior. Lord, I pray you bless the efforts of this work and, uh, and uh, you give us plenty of opportunities to preach the gospel to more people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.